Hello. The purpose of this video is to review some of the basic content of ANOVAs from your master's level statistics course before we get into the more intricate components of factorial ANOVAs that we're going to cover in this lecture. So ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. As you can see here, we have the AN, N for ANOVA, the O for of, and the VA for variance. It's a test of mean comparison with two requirements. It's going to have at least three sample means to compare for a one independent variable or have two or more independent variables. The typical research designs that will employ a ANOVA will be some form of pre-experimental design, your experimental designs, just true experimental and quasi-experimental, and then your ex post facto designs. ANOVAs are classified on, or a classification of statistics that vary on three components. First, they vary on the type of independent variable. So you'll have some ANOVAs that have independent groups, independent variables, or repeated measures, independent variables. Remember that independent groups portion is being able to compare um, independent observations. So you can be in one and only one group for the purpose of the study. You're either in the control group or the experimental group. You are either a Division I athlete, a Division II athlete, or a Division III athlete. In comparison, a repeated measures design is when you participate in all levels of the independent variable through dependent observations. This is going to have some element of paired testing um, repeated through conditions, so you might participate in a baseline test and then two weeks later, four weeks later, six weeks later, and the idea is the participants are on all levels. Then it's based on the number of independent variables. As I identified, fact, or ANOVAs can either have one independent variable that has three or more levels, that's called a one-way ANOVA, or it can have two or more independent variables that have two or more levels, and that's called a factorial. And depending on the number of independent variables you have, sometimes it will be a two-way, a three-way, a four-way, etc. Usually it stops about three, or three independent variables. Much past that gets a little hard to interpret. And then finally you have parametric versus non-parametric ANOVAs. Parametric ANOVAs, just through its base level of basic assumption, should have interval level of measurement or ordinal variables that are acting extremely continuous. However, ideally ordinal variables with four or more levels would be used for non-parametric analysis. When you combine these categories, what we have is a visual or a schematic that looks like this. So, as we described, an ANOVA can be either one way, if it has one independent variable, or a factorial if it has two or more independent variables. If it can have an ordinal dependent variable, you want to use a non-parametric. If it has an interval or ratio dependent variable, you want to use parametric. Notice factorial does not have non-parametric options. And then finally, if you go repeated measures versus independent groups, and somehow my block box didn't spread out the way it was, you have a in parametric independent groups option, a parametric repeated measures option, the Kruskal-Wallace is a non-parametric independent groups option. The Friedman ANOVA by ranks is a non-parametric non, non repeated measures option. And then with depending on how many independent variables you have in your parametric, you can have two or more independent variables, which would be an independent groups factorial ANOVA. You can have two or more repeated measures independent variables, which would mean a fully repeated measures factorial ANOVA, or you could have a combination of independent groups and repeated measures, which would lead to a mixed factorial ANOVA. In the lecture that we're going to do in class, we're going to focus predominantly on this factorial side, looking at individual differences for independent groups and repeated measures. Now, independent groups, variables, and factorial ANOVAs are often referred to as factors and are labeled with letters. For example, if the purpose of your study is to compare a two, ice versus no ice, by two, compression versus no compression, on the amount of ankle swelling, then your A factor would be icing and your B factor would be compression. 
Consequently, you would then label your, the extent to which icing is dependent on compression or your interaction factor an A by B interaction. Factorial novas are typically identified by the levels of their factors. So in our last example, we had a 2 by 2 factorial nova because each of our independent variables had two levels. If we had added a third level to the icing condition, such as no icing, ice pack, and ice bath, then we would have a 3 by 2 factorial nova. Or you could call it a 2 by 3. It really doesn't matter. Um, the ordering of which is often de determined by the researcher based on preference, <laughs> really. If we added a third independent variable of rest, rest or no rest, we would then have a 2 rest by 2 compression by 3 icing factorial ANOVA. Factors, or independent variables, can then be identified as fixed or random. Fixed factors are when the total number of factors is representative of the population of interest. Example, males, females, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 50 milligrams. This is what we use in applied, or applied sciences in our fields in HPER. Random factors consist of a selection of a large number of possible outcomes and can be employed in different types of disciplines. Most research that we'll see is going to come in fixed factors. So when we go to do our work in SPSS, in, or if I increase the size of this visual for the SPSS, we're going to enter our data into this fixed factors box when we go to enter our independent variables. Now, why would I choose to run a factorial ANOVA over doing multiple independent groups ANOVAs or t-tests? The first is going to be statistical power. When you run less tests, it does not tax alpha as much, decreasing the chance that you're going to commit type 1 error. Additionally, you have the statistical advantage of an interaction. If you run a t-test in a one-way ANOVA for the 2 by 3, then you couldn't see how factor A and factor, t factor B interact. This is a major statistical advantage of ANOVA, which we'll review in the next couple of slides. And then finally is ecological validity. In the real world, we rarely, don't see, we rarely see just one variable explain enough variance to understand how a dependent variable is changing. So when you put those two things together, understanding how multiple variables interact, that is more likely to represent the real world. Now what is an interaction? An interaction is defined as the examination of the extent to which the effect, or the effect of factor A is dependent on factor B. Now, for instance, in you are somebody, if we're trying to look at the enjoyment of coffee, so coffee enjoyment goes on my y-axis, then what we can see in the visual here is that you have, if you have no coffee and no sugar, you have relatively low enjoyment. If you have, or no cream, no sugar. If you have no cream with a little bit of sugar, that doesn't actually change your, your enjoyment all that much. If you have cream but no sugar, enjoyment goes up a little. Not a lot, but a little. However, if you combine the cream and the sugar, now we see enjoyment increase at a much higher level. This same visual is presented over here on the left, where we have similar amounts of enjoyment in the no cream condition, regardless of sugar or no sugar. We see a slight increase of adding cream with sugar and a, or, or without sugar and a much larger increase when you add cream with sugar. This change, the extent to which adding sugar changes the enjoyment at a much bigger level dependent on cream or no cream is what is defined here as the interaction. So interactions visually can be represented as a deviation from parallel lines. If we have parallel lines like we see here, where we have one group, excuse me, one, or we have, or the A variable, where group A1 is consistently does higher than group A2, even though we see an overall increase from V1 to B2, the increase is approximately the same. That's really represented by the slope. The slope in both of these are essentially identical. However, B1 to B2 in the second option have a, a very small slope where B1 or A1 to A2, B1 to B2 for group A1 has a much bigger slope. 
And so that deviation from parallel is what's indicating a, or is what's indicative of an interaction. So anytime you see a visual that demonstrates some form of deviation, sometimes it can look like any of these options, those are going to be visuals suggesting some form of interaction. However, if you see parallel lines in any direction, that is going to suggest a theoretical non-interaction. I'm going to point these out. These are all theoretical interactions. You can't guarantee statistical significance will occur. That's dependent on other factors such as sample size and effect. However, we can say that a theoretical act interaction is occurring. We can also name these interactions. If the lines on the graph do not cross within the values of the graph, that's going to be an ordinal interaction. So an example of an ordinal interaction is going to be something along the lines of this. This is your ordinal. Then, if the lines do cross within the interaction, or within the graph, something along the lines of this, that is your disordinal interaction. And if the lines were parallel, well, that's going to be no interaction. All right, hopefully this review has helped you and prepared you as we get ready for following the next content in class.